All right. So we're getting down to it. Uh, task nine is out. So all nine required programming tasks are released. You know exactly what you have to program in order to pass this class. Uh, of course, there are three more uh, application objective tasks to earn your six programming application objectives. But to pass the class, you know everything that's required programming wise. So test nine, our very last one. The description for this one is one of the simpler ones, probably the simplest, at least in terms of amount of text uh, to, uh, to explain it. But it is, and I've said this quite a few times, I feel like, uh, it is going to be one of the trickier ones, just historically speaking, what has given students trouble in the past. Uh, one of the harder ones to actually decide, uh, figure out how to code up. Uh, but what we want to do is figure out degrees of separation between actors in movies, where the degree of separation is either one, if those two people have starred in a movie together, their degree of separation is one, and if they haven't, their degrees of separation is how many actors you have to go through to get from one to the other, where each pair of actors uh, are connected if they have starred in a movie together. So if actor A and B, you're trying to find their degrees of separation, and they've both starred in a movie with actor C, then you go from actor A to actor C to actor B, uh, their degrees of separation would be two. And if you have to go through two additional actors, their degrees of separation would be three, and so on. Uh, so this is what we want to compute. And if they're not connected at all, if you can't get from one to the other, then your algorithm should return negative one to indicate that there was some error. Or if there was some uh, uh, input that isn't even a real person's name, uh, according to the movie's data that you have, that's uh, a negative one that you would return. And this is all stems from, uh, uh, from a game, the degrees of, uh, the six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon or computing somebody's Bacon number. How many movies do you have to go through or how many actors do you have to go through to get from any actor to Kevin Bacon? That would be their Bacon number. And that's what we're doing here, figuring out their degrees of separation, except we're computing it from any arbitrary pair of actors uh, or any people, really. Uh, just most of us would return negative one. We'd have an infinite Bacon number, unless uh, some of you have been in movies. So, uh, so that's what we want to do with this one. So the description of what we're doing isn't too bad. Maybe it takes a little bit to, to uh, get around what exactly it is, but the Wikipedia article can help here uh, to explain it uh, if my explanation doesn't quite make sense. But, uh, but that's what we want to do. So being able to do that, writing the code to do that, a little trickier but it's effectively one method that you're writing for this one. So I, I kind of like those, um, these assignments. I liked them as a, a student anyway, where it's very clear what the goal is, and the goal is just straight up challenging, as opposed to tasks where, here, implement these 20 methods. None of them are necessarily hard. It's just a whole bunch of stuff that you have to do. Um, those ones I didn't like so much. But uh, hopefully some of you agree with me. Some of you might disagree with me, but uh, which is fine. Um, but that's test nine, degrees of separation. Uh, this is going to use our movies.csv data or smaller test files, you know, whatever you're testing with, or no files at all for this one. You don't necessarily need files to test with. You can test with just, uh, the input is an array list of movies. So you can just create, manually create an array list of movies, like before test seven, the way we generate our test cases. Um, but your test should be smaller than the entire movies.csv at least for some of your tests. You can write a test with the entire file as well. There's nothing stopping you from that. Um, but just worth noting that movies.csv is very trimmed down. Uh, I've removed a lot of movies from that just to keep the data manageable. I've also removed a lot of actors from it. I think if, uh, if somebody appeared in that file less than five times, I think is what I settled on, uh, I just completely removed them from everything that they were in. Uh, just to get the number of bytes down in that file. So if somebody's in, for example, in the extreme, if somebody's only in one movie in that file, they have degrees of separation of one with all the people they've starred with and it would, negative one that we would return with everybody else. It wouldn't be super interesting to have that in there. So just to trim down the bytes. Uh, and then a lot of movies, uh, Lesser known movies were all removed. Any movie that shared a name with another movie, the less popular movie got removed. Uh, a lot of things like that. So uh, all that to say, uh, we're not going to find their exact bacon number because of all the data that's removed. But if you go to the source, 
of, uh, of the data that I got and you take the entire movies list, we can't actually compute their bacon numbers. We're doing the right math, the, not the right math, the, I guess the right math. It's, it's a bunch of plus one, but uh, the right math and the right programming, but with our data set, it's a little trimmed down. So don't rely on this if somebody's like, so-and-so, Chris Pratt's bacon number is two. And uh, because your code says it's, oh, I said that backwards. Uh, if somebody's like, hey, Chris Pratt's bacon number is one, and you're like, well, I'm going to run my code, and it says his number is two, uh, therefore I'm right because I had my code do this, and it was tested, and Autolab said I'm good, uh, just don't take that as the absolute ground truth. His bacon number is one, but it, this data set's going to say two um, because the data set uh, doesn't have the... Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special, where he started with Kevin Bacon. It doesn't have that in it, so it's not going to recognize that Bacon number of one. Uh, so just one example where our data is incomplete, so uh, don't take too much stock in it, but your code will be right. And I think I, did I, maybe I didn't link uh, the source for my data. I have it in my repo. I think I, because I just gave you the movies.csv file. Actually, I don't think, I'll have to link where I got that from. Is it terrible to do that right now? It's in a it's in another another repo. Uh, movies. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna paste it like this for now. Yeah, they got lost in translation at some point. I was moving the data around too many repos, and I lost my reference. Usually whenever I have data that I'm providing in a homework assignment, I'll have another file next to it with my reference of where I got the data from. Uh, it got lost in translation in this case, so let me make sure it's in there. It's a Creative Commons license, so I'm allowed to not have the license there. Like, I didn't do anything wrong, necessarily. But I always like to cite my sources anyway, even if I don't have to. Uh, I mean, they, they did a lot of work, you know, accumulating all of that data. They deserve some credit, right? Uh, all right, so any questions about that or anything else before we talk about graphs? So how we're going to compute degrees of separation is, of course, graphs. It's graphs week. We're going to need graphs. And we'll talk about graphs. Any questions before we do talk about graphs? If not, I'm going to talk about graphs. Okay. So we have a handful of data structures that we've learned so far in your uh, oh, nearly two semesters of computer science. Here's a, a good handful of data structures that you're familiar with. Sequential data structures, you've seen your uh, our array-based or array directly data structure. This was array in JavaScript, list in Python, array list in Java, and we briefly saw arrays and the list interface in Java as well. Uh, but some sequential data structure, that's one continuous block of memory. We've also seen linked list. This is another sequential data structure. Sequential meaning the order matters and the order is preserved in your data structure, uh, which was our linked list. Uh, that. Uh, is going to be spread across memory, but it's still sequential. If you append something to the end of a linked list, you expect that value to be at the end of the linked list. The order will be preserved in these sequential data structures. And we had two different sequential data structures. We also saw key value stores. This is where instead of storing values in some order or storing values at indices, 
we're going to store our values at keys. So we have some key, which can be any type, mapping to a value at any type. And with this, the order didn't matter anymore. When we insert values into our key value store, our object in JavaScript, our dictionary in Python, our hash map in, uh, in Java, uh, we, we just had values that we inserted, key value pairs that we stored. And then when we loop over them, if you loop over your hash map or dictionary or uh, object, you might get the values in, different, in a different order than the order in which you inserted them. Uh, just part of the data structure. And we also couldn't have multiple keys mapping to the same value, uh, which is kind of trippy when we start working with key value stores. But like, you can't store two values at an index in an array. We can never do that in a list, in an array, in an array list. We can't store two values at a single index. Uh, it's the same idea, but it does get a little trippier when the indices can be any value of a particular type. Uh, and then we move down to our first nonlinear data structure, a tree, where we have nodes that have values and child nodes, and we can have this branching structure, and as long as we're careful about how we use our tree, we can get this log n efficiency in our algorithms as we take advantage of the fact that every time we branch, we're only looking at half of the remaining data uh, every time we go down the tree. And that gives us a nice log n if we have balanced trees. And then we get data like this. And we're like, oh crap, how do we work with this? So this data, uh, the one example we're going to be looking at for this lecture, just because it's a smaller example of these three, is the early days of the internet, the early nodes of the internet that were connected to each other. Uh, but we can also have data for a subway system or roads. Roads, say we want to compute driving directions. We have intersections that are connected by strips of road and we want to figure out what sequence of intersections to traverse to be able to get from wherever I am to my destination. Subway stations, same way. We have subway stations that are connected by rails. How do we get from point A to point B? Well, I got to get on this line, go to this station, switch to this line, go to this station. We have this idea that nodes, whether they be stations, intersections, or um, or nodes in the internet. I, I should just call them routers, I think. Um, there's a, a bigger term for them, but I keep blanking on what they are. Uh, locations. Locations uh, are our nodes, and they're connected by either rails, roads, or cables. How are we going to represent this information? How are we going to work with this information with the data structures we have? And of course, the answer is we're not, because it's graphs week. We're going to use graphs. Uh, but let's try to use what we have already. Uh, I think tree is the only one that really makes sense. It's our only non-sequential, uh, not non-sequential, non-linear data structure. And we don't have any clear linearity. We can't uh, uh, you know, store these just in a straight, straight up order. I mean, we could, but there's not much that makes sense with that. Uh, so let's try tree since it's our first non-linear data structure. So we can't use a binary tree because we need more than one child if we're going to have our nodes be the locations. And then our, the child nodes would be every location that's connected to that location. So if we start with UCLA and we say the child nodes of UCLA are going to be all the locations that are connected to it, Stanford, UCSB, RAND, and SRI and have all those as child nodes, and then go to each of those child nodes and have a child node for each one that's connected to them. So let's try uh, Stanford and find all the child nodes, and our child nodes of Stanford are SRI and UCLA. Oh, whoops. UCLA, well, that was where we just came from, and we're adding it to the graph again. And SRI is uh, already in the tree, but we want to get the information that Stanford and SRI are connected, but SRI already exists in the tree, uh, and we get this really awkward situation of how do we represent that information with our tree. We're gonna have these duplicate nodes, uh, and at worst case, depending on how we build our tree, like we can say we're gonna skip UCLA because we're the child of UCLA, or else we're gonna go UCLA, Stanford, UCLA, Stanford, UCLA, Stanford, and easily go infinite. So let's not backtrack back up to the parent node. 
but how are we going to represent this edge here, the fact that Stanford and SRI are connected, even though SRI is already in the graph up here, is a child of UCLA. Things get dicey. It's gonna to be tough to, to work with a tree. Let's try this again. And the big reason that it doesn't really work with a tree is we're not allowing cycles in a tree. A tree can't have something called a cycle. So let's try again, except whatever we are adding, about to add a duplicate node, we just don't, but we still add a connection to the existing node. So from Stanford to SRI, we don't add a new node for SRI, but we do add this connection. Now in a tree, this would be a child node, where SRI, the existing node, would be a child node of Stanford, and then SRI would have like UCLA as a child node. Uh, that still gets crazy, so we're just gonna call this something else, and we're gonna call it a graph. Uh, so we have ourselves a graph here, which is very similar to a tree. It's the same kind of idea in the fact that you have nodes that are connected in some way, except now we're not connecting them through references to child nodes. We're going to connect them through something called edges. So a cycle is where you can get from one node back to itself without repeating any nodes and without doubling back across one of these connections. So UCLA to Stanford to SRI to UCLA, that's a cycle in this graph, which is something that's not allowed in a tree. You cannot have a cycle in a tree. So in the land of theory, so we're gonna represent our graphs very differently than the way we represented our trees, but in the world of theory, away from how we actually code this stuff up, bless you, a tree is a graph. If you have any graph that doesn't have, kind of, a graph that doesn't have cycles, it's a tree. If you have a tree, it is a graph, it's just a graph that doesn't have cycles. Again, in the land of theory, we're gonna represent our trees different than graphs, but a graph with no cycles is a tree. Once you have a cycle, you're a graph. And there are very different algorithms that we, uh, that we need to use to work with graphs. Our tree traversals, which was our big algorithm that we used with trees, was our post-order, pre-order, in-order traversals, don't work on graphs. Say we did run our, uh, one of our traversals. We start at UCLA. UCLA is gonna make four recursive calls. The Stanford recursive call is gonna make an SRI recursive call, which already has a call on the stack for it. Uh, SRI, depending on how we implement it, might make a recursive call to Stanford or UCLA in UCSB, uh, all of which already have frames on the stack. Eventually, we'll get back to a call of UCLA and start the whole process over, put these four back on the stack with new stack frames, and we go infinite. We're gonna keep traveling around those cycles and keep making recursive calls forever. It's why we can't have a cycle in a tree. Even in our regular tree data structure, if we had Stanford have a reference to UCLA as one of its child nodes and we run one of our traversals on it, it goes infinite. It's gonna be an infinite recursion and your code's gonna blow up. So we can't do that. We can't use our regular algorithms, so we gotta throw away our algorithms and come up with a new set of algorithms to work with our graph data structure. And to do that, we're actually gonna represent the, I've alluded to this several times just now, but we're going to represent our graphs very differently as well. Instead of storing our nodes that store references to other nodes, and we have this nodes and references based structure, we're going to, bless you, we're going to store our nodes and edges separately. So we have an edge, which is going to be a connection between two nodes. Uh, the idea of a node is pretty similar to what it's been. A node is going to know the information stored at that node. So this node has the value UCLA, this node has the value SDC, MIT, Utah, et cetera. But an edge is a new idea where we used to have references to another node. Here we have the idea of an edge, which is a connection between two nodes. So there is an edge connecting UCLA and SRI. So we'll store that in our data structure, in our graph, to say, hey, those two nodes 
have a connection between them called an edge. We're going to store that separately. So a graph is defined by its nodes and its edges. And we're going to do that using an adjacency list. Yay. So an adjacency list, you've probably seen, you sh most of you have seen adjacency lists, adjacency matrix, graphs, nodes, edges uh, in 191. Uh, so hopefully I can leverage that quite a bit. But not all of you are in 191, so I still have to explain all this stuff. So I'll still explain it all for those of you who aren't. Uh, but adjacency list is the only one we won't, we'll be working with in 116. Uh, we won't use an adjacency matrix. Adjacency list, I suppose you could if you wanted to. Like we, if you want to use the starter code that we give for a graph, uh, it uses an adjacency list. I ain't going to stop you, actually, from using an adjacency matrix. I don't care if you code it that way. Um, but this, this is the only thing I'm going to show in the slides and in any code that I give, is an adjacency list where for each node, we're going to track all of the nodes that are connected to that node via an edge. So UCLA is connected to Stanford, SRI, UCSB, and RAND through edges, those are its four, what we call neighbors. So it's four neighbors, we're gonna store them in an adjacency list under that node. Same with any node, SDC has neighbors Utah and Rand, SDC has neighbors Utah and Rand. So we're representing the same information, we're just representing all of the information of this graph in this format, and this is kind of, uh, so we had the question, what data structure are we going to use to represent graphs? And we were kind of asking the wrong question. We should be asking what data structures we're going to use. So it's going to end up in our code being a hash map where the, uh, where the values are array lists. So we're going to start meshing our data structures together. We're using a sequential data structure and a key value store to be able to get the information that we want. And for what it's worth, if we wanted a matrix, it would be like an array list of array lists. You'd have some two-dimensional data structure. We're going to combine two different data structures to get the information that we want here. And the, the graph on the left, this visual one, the wrong button. This visual one, like this is fine for us, for humans to look at. Uh, we like visuals. And this, I think, is a lot easier for me to process if I'm looking at it. But when we go into our code, this is going to be a lot easier for the computer to process. It's going to be a lot easier for you to write your algorithms, write your code that's going to work with the data and get the information that we want out of this thing, which for test nine is going to be degrees of separation. This on the right is going to let us do that. Uh, we can't feed the visual into the computer and, have, and say, here, figure it out. I mean, we can, but that's way more intense coding than what you're expected to do in 116. Uh, you could analyze the picture and extract all the information out of it, um, but that's intense. That's intense stuff. So we're going to represent it as an, an adjacency list. And here's, I only have one slide with code on it today, so I'll spend a bit of time on this slide uh, so we can, we can talk about what this is, how we're actually going to code these graphs, how we're going to use these things. And this is it. This is how we're going to do it. So when I want to represent that graph on the previous slide, I'm going to create a graph, which is going to take a generic type. I, Paul chose n for the generic type, presumably because of node. n for node seems fine to me. Uh, but we're going to work with a generic type so we can create a graph of anything. This is true for all of our data structures. It was true for our... Uh, linked lists, our binary trees, our BSTs, uh, they all took generic types because we want our data structure to work with generic type. If Java said, hey, I got this beautiful array list for you, but you can only ever use doubles, uh, it wouldn't be very useful. So we want to code our stuff with a generic type, and then we're going to store an adjacency list of that type, a hash map of that type to an array list of that type, which is just like the adjacency list we saw on the previous slide. Where, for our example, that type is going to be string. We'll create a graph of string, and we'll add all the edges into our graph based on which two locations, which pairs of locations should be connected. 
So when we create our new graph, we'll initialize our adjacency list to be empty. And when we add a new edge, uh, this is coded, which I'm kind of regretting now. Um, Paul talked me into this one, so it's his fault. But, uh, but coding this as a directed graph, which means when you add an edge, it's coming from that edge to the other edge, and you can't go back. Like, for example, if I added just an edge, if I called add edge UCLA to Stanford, that means I can send messages from UCLA to Stanford, but not from Stanford to UCLA, not the other way around. I would have to call add edge twice, once uh, in either direction to be able to get that functionality. Uh, so we can use this add by directional edge, and this is going to add the direction, the edges in both directions. So we can, if I add a bi-directional edge, this means that you can travel in both directions on that edge, and effectively in our representation, we're going to add that edge twice, one from one node to the other, and then another from the other node to this node. Uh, so add uh, two edges, add that edge both times in our adjacency list to the list for both of those nodes. So in either case, whenever we add an edge, we're doing some more lazy initialization, which came up once early in the semester, um, but we're going to do that again here, where we're going to initialize a node at the last moment possible. So if we're adding an edge, we're gonna check for both nodes. Does this node exist? Have we ever seen this node before? And if the answer is no, we're going to initialize it. So we're gonna add each node, and we're gonna check, have I seen this node before? So if this is the very first time we've seen this node, this is going to be false. It won't be in our adjacency list as a key. So we're going to initialize it in the adjacency list with a new empty array list. So we'll do that at the last moment. If both these nodes are already in our graph, then this add node does nothing. But if it, they aren't, if either one of them haven't been seen before, we're initializing it. And then going to our adjacency list, getting the array list for each node, and then adding the other node to each array list. So each node in the adjacency list knows about the connection to the other node. And we load up all of our edges, and we have a graph, the exact graph that we've seen on the other slides, but in our code in a way that we can work with. And I, I didn't put it on the slide, but then we have a get, um, get adjacency list method and that's the one you'll call during your code when you're computing the, um, the degrees of separation. You'll get the whole adjacency list and ask it questions. Hey, who are the neighbors of this one? Are these nodes connected? Things like that. And notice this actually came up in the other lecture, uh, so worth mentioning, I suppose. Uh, but add node is a private method, meaning I don't expect anybody from the outside world to know or care that this method exists. Uh, which is an example of encapsulation. Uh, I, I've had like a few slides earlier in the semester, but worth repeating what encapsulation is. Encapsulation is where we're hiding the details. Nobody needs to care that I have this add node method, or necessarily that I even use an adjacency list to represent my graph. Those are implementation details, not important to the caller. Uh, the fact that we use an adjacency list will be important because we have a get adjacency list method, so that is exposed. Uh, through that method. Um, but add node, this method, nobody has to care about this. So we're going to hide the details in a private method, and then people interact with our code by adding edges, and they don't have to care how we add the nodes. Uh, but for what it's worth, this graph can't add a node that doesn't have any edges, which is legal in a graph that's perfectly allowed, um, but our implementation just falls a little bit short of that uh, in the spirit of keeping things a little simpler and that you don't have to add your nodes and then add your edges. Okay, any questions on the code before we go back to theory? I should mention this week, more than most weeks, we're at the point in the semester, and probably similar to the next three weeks as well, um, we're at the point where I assume that you're getting pretty good at coding in Java and coding in general. Uh, that slides will be mostly theory now. I can say this is what a graph is, this is like how we would represent it, and then I expect you to be able to make the jump of, okay, how do I actually code that? Like you should be at the point where you can do that. You can take a high-level idea concept and turn it into code. Um, 
I think that's reasonable at nearly two semesters of, uh, of programming. You should be able to take an idea and turn it into code. Um, that said, uh, on Wednesday, the plan is to go through the details of how to implement breadth-first search, which will be the big thing that we need in test nine. I'm not going to show any code about it. No code's going to be given with it. But I will go over like the details. I'll say, you'll want this data structure here. You'll want to do this and that. I'll explain in plain English how to implement breadth-first search and how to use it for test nine to get test nine done. But we're at the point where I don't have to show you the code of how to actually do that. It's up to you to be able to take the idea of an algorithm and code it up. Um, all right, I think I've rambled enough. Nobody has questions. I'll give some time. Moving on. So let's go back to theory land. So uh, we need the definition of a path. Talk about some things that we're going to talk about. A path is a sequence of nodes where each consecutive pair of nodes are connected by an edge. So this sequence of nodes is a path. I can go from UCLA to SRI using an edge, SRI to Utah with an edge, to MIT, to BBN, to RAND. All of those pairs of nodes are connected by an edge, so this is a valid path in the graph. And it would be more relevant Wednesday, but the length of a path is the number of edges in the path. So this path has a length 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, because that's how many edges I had to traverse. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 edges to get from UCLA to RAND. What we'll eventually want to do is find the length of the shortest path between two nodes, which we'll call the distance between those nodes. And that, the way we'll set up the graphs for task nine, that distance is going to be the degrees of separation between two people. SRI Utah BBN is not a path. SRI to Utah connected by an edge. Utah to BBN, there's no edge connecting those two nodes, so this is not a valid path. There have to be edges connecting each pair of nodes, uh, each consecutive pair of nodes in the path for it to be a path. Graph for search. So any questions on what a graph is, the structure of a graph, how we represent graphs, what an adjacency list is, how that code worked that I showed? Any questions on any of that? Because I think, is, if you're in 191, I think so far it's been review. I believe they cover everything that we've said so far. Um, but I'm pretty certain, unless they added it recently, uh, that they don't do breath-first search. So before we go into breath-first search, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page before we talk about this. And the idea today, did I do the overview of the week yet? The idea today, I'll give you, introduce what a graph is. Done. Check. Uh, talk about breath-first search at a very high level. I'm just going to briefly introduce breath-first search and what it is, what it does, uh, you know, why we use it, how we use it. Uh, just a few things about breath-first search. Wednesday, I'm going to go, I won't show code. Yeah, that, that's what I said. I didn't do the whole overview, but I said I won't show much uh, or any code on Wednesday. I might show a little bit uh, if it's relevant. But uh, Wednesday is all about the details of breath-first search. I'm going to walk you through, with all kinds of visuals and stuff, how exactly we use breath-first search. And then your, your task is to code Wednesday's lecture effectively in the actual code. But I'll tell you what data structures to use, when to use them, how to use them how to track your distance information, which will be your degrees of separation, how to set up your graph to begin with. Like, I'll walk you through the whole thing. Uh, and then your idea is to take my English sentences and turn them into code, basically, uh, which is tough. Uh, I think test nine is, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I think test nine is the, the most, like, raw, like, purely difficult task. Uh, the description is one of the simplest but actually doing it is one of the hardest, just historically speaking, what has given students trouble in the past. I don't remember if I said that in this lecture or the last one, but if I said that twice, sorry. Um, I don't think it's that hard. Uh, I don't want to get scared about it, but just compared to the other tasks, I think it's one of the harder ones, if not the hardest. 
uh, with the exception of the application objective tasks, of course. Those ones are going to be harder, uh, but they're supposed to be. And you don't need those to pass, so it, it, the stakes aren't as high either. Uh, and then on Friday, it'll be one big memory diagram. Uh, not with breath first search. Breath first search is a bit too much to do in a memory diagram, either in lecture or on your quiz. Uh, but we'll do a memory diagram of some simpler algorithms on a graph. We have a few in the repo. The are connected. Check if two nodes are connected at all. Uh, and check if a path is a valid path. I think checking if a path is a valid path would be a good one to do for what will actually be our last memory diagram of the semester. Unless I get, uh, unless I get real cheeky and do a memory diagram in the next three weeks during the AO stuff which I don't intend to because there's no quizzes on that material. So I'll only do a memory diagram if I really think it'll help con you know, uh, crystallize the concepts in your minds. Which maybe it will, maybe it won't. I think at this point you've seen enough memory diagrams that it, you'll, you should be able to see the memory diagram, even if I don't show it. Maybe that's too strong of an assumption, I don't know. But anyway, if nobody has questions, I've rambled to give you time to ask questions. If there are no questions, so let's just move on. Uh, so let's introduce a little more uh, definition, the connected component. Uh, how do I tell if a graph is connected? Or more specifically, how do I check if there exists a path between any two nodes in a graph? This is kind of a precursor question to the question we actually want to answer, which is what's the distance between any two nodes? Uh, but first, to set that up, let's just ask the question of how do I even tell if two nodes are connected? So if two nodes, for your task nine, if two nodes aren't connected at all, then your method returns negative one. They're just not connected. So let's at least work on that one. How do we figure that one out? So if two nodes are not connected, well, we're just going to look at the graph, right? UCLA and Carnegie, they're connected, right? I can find a path through this graph to connect them. They're connected. And this whole graph is connected. This entire graph is one connected component. So we say that the entire graph is connected. But it doesn't have to be. What, if I remove two edges here, now this graph is no longer connected, so I can't get from any location to any other location, UCLA to Carnegie, no matter how hard I try now, I'm never going to get there. I can't, oop, that's not an edge. I can't get over to Carnegie now. There's no path from UCLA to Carnegie, so they are not connected. I have two connected components in this graph now. This graph is not connected. So how do we tell two nodes are connected? Well, I just look at it, right? Now I look at it, and I can't find that path, so UCLA and Carnegie are not connected. But the internet got a little bit bigger since the early days of just a handful of locations. We have lots of locations now. Uh, I believe uh, this graph is IP addresses, and can you get from one address to another by clicking a hyperlink? And I'm not going to do this visually anymore if I have some uh, IP address over here and some over here. I can't just visually verify that there actually is a connection between the two. We're going to want algorithms. Uh, for your homework, you're encouraged to still generate smaller uh, inputs for your tests so you can actually generate the expected solutions. But eventually, you do want your algorithm to run on the entire movies.csv file and generate the degrees of separation between any two actors in that entire file, which uh, it's a bit of a taller task. We're not going to do that visually anymore. We're not just going to look at the graph. We want computers with very fast processing power to be able to compute this for us, which is why we're all here, isn't it? We want to leverage the, the tool, our computer, to be able to do the work for us. So let's learn breadth-first search. Breadth-first search is what we're going to use to both figure out the connected components uh, figure out if two nodes are connected, and eventually, on Wednesday, I'll walk you through how to do it, figure out the distance between two nodes. So with breath first search, the quick overview is we're going to choose a starting node. I'm going to choose UCLA here. And we're going to keep exploring the neighbors of nodes that we explore. So we're going to explore UCLA, and this green box is representing my explored nodes. Then we're going to explore all of the neighbors of UCLA. For that, we're going to look at our adjacency list, and we're going to look up all the neighbors. And we're going to explore all of those neighbors. And any node that we just explored, 
we're going to explore their neighbors. So we're going to explore the neighbors of the neighbors of the starting node. So we're going to look at all these nodes, and we find Utah and SDC as the new nodes. Then we're going to explore the neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors, and we're just going to keep expanding and expanding and expanding until we have a round of this where we don't add any new nodes. So Utah and SDC, all of their neighbors are already explored. So we don't add any new nodes when we explore their neighbors. So we're done. We found the connected component of UCLA. Any node that has been explored is connected to UCLA. And any node that hasn't been explored is not connected to UCLA. And the big trick of this algorithm, the, the big idea, the, the idea that makes this suitable for graphs, but not for, um, I was going to say not for trees, but that's not true. Suitable for graphs when we're allowed to have cycles is that we're never visiting a node twice. If we've already visited a node, we're not visiting it again. So each time we add a node to this green box, we never visit it again. We don't go back to it and visit its neighbors again, explore all of its neighbors again. We don't do that twice. So keeping track of that to be able to not visit it twice is the big, uh, the big thing that we want to do. And to do that, our very brief overview is to use a queue to track the order in which we'll visit nodes. That'll be very important when we're computing the distance, especially when we, we want to compute how far away each node is from the starting node is eventually what we'll figure out. So we're going to use a queue to track the order in which we'll visit the nodes. We're going to enqueue the starting node. And then, we're going to re uh, and then we're going to keep track of all the nodes that have been explored. And we're going to explore the starting node and then repeatedly go to our queue, dequeue the first node in the queue, the next node that's up, and visit any of its neighbors that have not already been explored. And whenever we visit a node, we're going to queue it up. We're going to add it to the queue. So that's my very brief explanation of how the algorithm works. So we would enqueue UCLA and mark it as explored, which for explored, you can use any data structure you want. I assume most of you will use an array list then ArrayList.Contains to check if they're explored. But we're going to mark UCLA as explored and add it to the queue. Then we're going to repeatedly check the queue, dequeue the first element in the queue, and explore its neighbors. So we're going to check UCLA's neighbors, Stanford, SRI, UCSB, and RAND. And for each one of those nodes, we're going to visit it if it hasn't already been visited and if it hasn't been visited, we mark it as visited or mark it as explored. I'm mixing the, those two terms. We're going to mark it as explored and then add it to the queue. So we add Stanford to the queue, SRI to the queue, UCSB to the queue, and RAND to the queue. So we have four elements, four nodes in our queue. And we're going to mark them all as explored. Then we're done. So we're done visiting the neighbors of UCLA. So we go back to our queue. We go to our queue, and just assuming that we added them in this order, we're going to go to Stanford, dequeue it, and explore all of its neighbors. So we're going to say, hey, Stanford, who are your neighbors? UCLA and SRI. We're going to ask our adjacency list, who are your neighbors? UCLA and SRI, we're going to check UCLA, and we're going to see that it's already been explored. So you're going to have some conditional. If this has already been explored, don't do anything. We're just not going to do anything. It's already been explored. Who cares about it? We already know about it. We're done. Then we go to SRI, the other neighbor. Has this one been explored? Yes, don't do anything. And so we're done with Stanford's neighbors. So we go to the queue, DQ SRI. We have three values in the queue. We're going to DQ SRI, so we only have two left in the queue. We're going to look at SRI's neighbors. SRI, who are your neighbors? OK, UCLA, it's already been explored. Don't do anything. UCSB, it's already been explored. Don't do anything. The, and this is how we're avoiding our infinite loops, not exploring a node twice. Utah, this one has not been explored. So whenever we find a node, a neighbor that hasn't been explored yet, we're going to mark it as explored, because we're exploring it right now, and we're going to add it to our queue. 
So Mark Utah is explored and added to the queue behind Rand. Check Stanford, it's already been explored, don't do anything. UCSB, the three neighbors have all already been explored, so we won't end up doing anything. DQ Rand, UCLA and UCSB have already been explored, so we don't do anything, but SDC is not. So mark SDC is explored and add it to the queue. At this point, we have Utah and SDC in the queue. DQ Utah, visit its neighbors, SRI and SDC have both been explored, don't do anything. DQ SDC, Utah and Rand have already been explored, so don't do anything. Go back to our queue. There's nothing left in the queue. Once the queue is empty, we're done. That's when the algorithm shuts down and says, I've explored the entire connected component. Exactly when that queue is empty is exactly when you're done, um, when you're done exploring, when you know that you're done exploring the connected component. And again, details and visuals and everything to come on Wednesday. That was a very quick overview. If you understood all of that, then you're doing excellent. You're way ahead of the game. If you didn't understand all that, don't worry. Wednesday's going to get you. Uh, Wednesday will get you. More details to come. So with connectivity, run breadth first search starting at node A. You want to know our node A and node B connected. Start at node A, run breadth first search. And if at any point during the run of the algorithm, so after the queue is empty and you break out of your loop, check, hey, did I ever explore node B? Is node B explored? And if it is, the two nodes are connected. If it's not, those two nodes are not connected. Node B is not in the connected component of node A. So that's connectivity, and then we want to expand on that and get the actual distance information. So the idea is that we'll, our, we'll build our graph, any two actors, if they were in the same movie, if they were in a movie together, then there's an edge connecting them, connecting their two nodes. We build our entire graph with that information. We choose one actor, run breath first search, get the distance from that actor to the other one. If it's finite, we return it. If that other actor has not been explored, return negative one. That's our overall idea for task nine, for the degrees of separation. Any questions on that? Y'all are on zero questions for the whole lecture. You're killing me down here. Any questions right at the end here? Or should we just get out of here? I'm not waiting again. <laughs> Let's just get out of here.